So first of all, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jane Anderson, and I have the huge privilege of co-chairing London's Fast Track Cities Initiative Leadership Group, together with my colleague, Professor Kevin Fenton from Public Health England. And on behalf of the National AIDS Trust, Britain Thinks and Fast Track Cities London, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome so many people here today for the launch of the 2021 HIV Public Knowledge and Attitudes Survey. Now, the Fast Track Cities Initiative in London brings together all those organisations and communities in our city who are working together to end new HIV infections, to eliminate HIV-associated stigma and discrimination, to stop preventable HIV-related death, and to ensure that people living in London with HIV have the best possible quality of life. But of course, if we're to achieve these ambitious goals, it's critically important that we have the most up-to-date information about people's knowledge and attitudes to HIV. So we were absolutely delighted to be in a position to commission this critically important piece of research, which we hope will provide essential insights and learning for our work in London, as well as for all the other fast track cities across the UK. Now, this research has come at a particularly important moment because the government has pledged to end new HIV transmissions by 2030 and is at this very moment developing its action plan to set out how this goal is going to be achieved in England and at the same time discussions are happening uh, in other UK nations. So this moment is exactly the right time for us to be able to add additional research information to this process. And understanding the prevailing attitudes and information is critically important if we're going to tackle the misinformation and negative approaches that we know stops people discussing HIV, discussing sexual health openly, and it stops people accessing HIV testing and all the other services that can support people and support better sexual health. So without this, we're not going to reach these collective goals. And we know there's much more to do to ensure the well-being of people living with HIV in London and across the whole of the UK. And we need the evidence to ensure that we're targeting the right gaps in knowledge in the right ways. And that is where the evidence that's being presented today comes in. Because in London, it isn't enough to rely on our perceptions we need to know where public knowledge and attitudes are now through evidence before we can start to actually work to address them. And through our regular discussions with other fast track cities, we know we aren't the only ones facing this problem, not only in the UK, but globally. And so that's why we've commissioned this piece of work. It's a UK wide piece of research. It's providing up to date information on what the public knows and thinks about HIV now in 2021. The last and much smaller survey of this type was done more than six years ago. And actually in the field of HIV, that's a long time. It's a rapidly changing field. Now, the life of the National AIDS Trust was the successful bidder for this work because it's an organization that already has a wealth of history in delivering similar surveys. And so it could provide a strong foundation on which to build. An NAT worked with a specialist research agency, Britain Thinks, to conduct the work and had a vision for a programme that would involve sector and community stakeholders right from the beginning, so that this final research data would be as valuable as possible to everybody who can use it. So before we go into the presentations and the information and the discussion, I know you're all very keen to hear a few housekeeping points. First of all, we know there's going to be lots of questions. If you have a question for the speakers and the panelists, please put them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom um, menu bar. Don't use the uh, chat function because we won't be monitoring that in the same way and we won't necessarily see your question. We also know that given the amount of data that there is today, an hour and a half is really a very small amount of time. So we may not be able to answer everything that comes up during the uh, webinar, but we will do our utmost to follow up by email or whichever other way we can communicate to make sure that uh, we answer the points that are raised. 
So it's now my immense pleasure to hand over to the team members from Britain Thinks, Anastasia Knox, who's an associate partner, and Catherine Allen, who's a research lead, to take us through some of the key findings for this work. Anastasia, Katie, over to you. Lovely, thank you so much, Jane, and, and good afternoon, everyone. We're really delighted and excited to be here to share the piece of this work with you this afternoon. Um, I'm going to do a quick run through of the methodology, um, and then I'll pass over to Katie, who's going to take you through the headlines, essentially, of what is a really substantive report that, that sits underneath the, the piece of work or the, the slides we'll be taking you through this afternoon. If you could move me forward, Esedin. Perfect, thank you. So um, we kicked off this piece of work in January with a series of three stakeholder round tables. Um, and the aim of these was really to bring expert opinion into the research really early on to make sure we could use that to inform the design, but also just to make sure that the voices of the community were, were heard throughout. In March, we delivered two exploratory focus groups. Those were delivered in two locations across the, the UK um, and include, included a demographic mix uh, in terms of things like age, gender, and so forth. And the role of those um, groups was really to make sure that the survey was rooted in how people think and talk about HIV, so, so that the questions were intuitive and people were able to understand them. We also looked at where public perceptions from H on HIV come from, their understanding of HIV, and as I say, the language that people use when they talk about it. The findings from that survey we used to inform the design of the quantitative research. This was a nationally representative online survey, total sample unweighted of just over 3,000 respondents. Um, and that generated some really robust statistics on current public understanding and awareness of HIV. From, those, uh, that, from that quantitative data, we identified two groups that we wanted to do follow-up deep dive focus groups with. So we did two focus groups with Black British participants um, and two with British South Asian participants. Um, and, and those groups were really identified for quite different reasons. The South Asian participants we decided to focus on because the quantitative data identified lower levels of knowledge than the general public, and we wanted to understand why that was. Um, the black focus groups with black people were delivered because of the comparatively higher prevalence of HIV amongst that group versus the general public. So we wanted to understand where they were coming from. So with that, I will pass over to Katie, who's going to take you through the key findings. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Anastasia. So as I did, we go to the next slide, thank you. So the first main finding is that most of the public don't hear or think about HIV that much. So if we go to the next slide. So in the focus groups that we conducted, most of the participants felt that they only occasionally heard about HIV. And that was really coming from them comparing how much they hear about HIV to how much they hear about other health issues. Um, so compared to those, they felt that they, they, they kind of heard and, and see very little about HIV. Uh, and that was attributed to feeling that, that HIV isn't as much of an issue for society as these other health conditions. And underlying that was a bit of an assumption that information that's available on HIV is being targeted at higher risk groups. Um, so some participants cited LGBT people as a potential group who might be seeing more information, for example. And when participants were thinking about when they'd actually last heard about HIV, many tended to fall back on these quite historical examples like Freddie Mercury uh, or fictional representations like the recent It's a Sin. Uh, and for some, for quite a few, they felt the last time they'd actually properly heard about HIV was, was during school and sex and relationships education. Next slide, please. So um, in the survey, we asked about uh, where, if anywhere, people had seen or heard things about HIV in the last six months. And what we found is that over six in 10 reported not having heard anything about HIV in the last six months. So that's obviously over half of the public. Um, and of, of those that had heard things, um, TV programs and films was the most common source for, for hearing about HIV recently. And there were some, some groups that were more likely to say that they'd not heard anything about HIV in the last six months. Uh, and those were older people, so those aged 65 plus compared to younger people, uh, non-Londoners compared to Londoners, uh, white people and South Asian people compared to black people, those in rural areas compared to those in urban areas, 
and heterosexual cisgender people compared to gay and bisexual men and LGBT people as a whole. So the next finding is around knowledge of HIV just being quite patchy uh, amongst the general public. So whilst awareness of some of the high risk modes of transmission um, is fairly high amongst the general public, many actually believe that HIV can be passed on through uh, ways in which there is very low or almost no risk. Um, so what this chart shows is some different uh, possible ways of, of um, transmission that we presented to survey respondents and it just shows the percentage that um, selected that as a way that they thought HIV could be passed from person to person. Uh, and we've sort of colour coded them there. So the green ones are uh, possible routes of transmission. Uh, so sex without a condom between two men, between a man and a woman, and by sharing needles or syringes. And as you can see, quite high percentages of the general public were able to identify those um, correctly, over 80% for all of those three ways. However, you can also see some quite high percentages there for ways in which there is um, no risk. Um, so standing on a, a used needle, a blood transfusion in the UK, um, and, and quite a high percentage, 58% uh, identify oral sex as well, um, even though that has a very, a very low um, risk of HIV transmission. Next slide, please. So, um, most can identify the three main modes of transmission, as I was saying, uh, but they also mistakenly identify at least one way that it can't. Um, so what we've done here is we've categorized the, the public by their, their levels of knowledge of HIV transmission, um, just to kind of try and make sense of the data a little bit. Um, so what we've come up with is, is three broad categories in terms of how much people know about transmission. So the first is the lower than average knowledge of transmission. So that's actually about a quarter of the public that fall into that category. And what that means is people that fail to identify all of those three main modes of transmission. So obviously that's a fairly high percentage of people not knowing all three of those ways where they could potentially be at risk um, of acquiring HIV. And South Asian people, young people and Londoners are more likely to be in that group. There's also a very large group, so a majority, 57% of the public, that fall into a group, what, what we call middling knowledge of HIV, HIV transmission. And what that means is that they identify all of those three main modes, but they also identify one way that HIV cannot be acquired as well. So although they're getting those main ways correctly, they're also believing that there's some ways that, that it's just not possible to and um, to acquire HIV. Um, and then there's also um, a small group, so just 8% of the public that have what we call high knowledge of HIV transmission. So that means that they only identify those three main modes um, and then no uh, incorrect um, answers there. Uh, and then there's a further one in 10 that have what we call higher than average knowledge of transmission. Uh, and that means that they only identify the main modes of transmission and then oral sex without a condom or dental dam as well, just because there is a, a very small, but um, yeah, extremely low risk there, but that, that is a possible route of transmission. Next slide, please. Great. Um, so another thing we found was that public awareness of uh, U equals U uh, is, is low. Um, so there's a majority that believe that it's false that effective treatment prevents transmission. So we presented people with lots of statement, uh, statements and asked them to select whether they are certain the statement is true, feel the statement is true, feel the statement is false or are certain the statement is false. Um, and as you can see, uh, just 16% said that they were certain or, or felt it was true that there is zero risk of someone who is taking effective HIV treatment, passing on HIV through sex. And there's some groups that have a particularly uh, or relatively higher awareness of U equals U. Um, women, 18% um, felt that was true. Obviously, that's not a huge increase. Um, younger people, people living in Scotland, interestingly, and London, black people, gay and bisexual men, broadsheet readers, and those that know someone living with HIV, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly there. Next slide, please. 
And focus group participants expressed some skepticism about U equals U when we when we covered this in the groups. And there was a sense from some that, that there could be no such thing as, as zero risk. Um, the public in general have, have low understanding um, of the details of how HIV is transmitted and how treatment works, um, i.e. kind of reducing the viral load to undetectable levels. We did find that COVID-19 and the pandemic does appear to have raised some awareness of the term viral load, um, but few were able to kind of apply that, that term um, more broadly outside of, of COVID-19. And very few um, are aware that effective treatment reduces the transmission risk of HIV to zero, or that um, most people living with HIV in the UK are on effective treatment. And some participants were also just worried about the extent to which U equals U relies on people living with HIV consistently taking their treatment, which further undermined their faith in the, in the sort of efficacy of that treatment at presenting, um, preventing transmission. There's also just a broader sense for some people that there can be no such thing as, as zero risk, both when they're thinking about uh, the transmission of, of HIV, but just life generally. Um, so there's this broad sense of, of U equals U being just too good to be true amongst um, some members of the public. Awareness of PrEP is low as well. Um, so we also present to people with a statement that there is medicine people can take that will stop them acquiring HIV. And only a quarter, as you can see there, felt that that was, that was true. Um, so awareness is, is fairly low there. Next slide, please. So HIV continues to be seen as a serious condition uh, by the public, but there are signs that a new narrative around HIV has started to cut through. However, understanding of that is quite vague. Next slide. So uh, when we uh, prompted survey respondents to think about HIV, um, around half of them uh, agreed that HIV is one of the most serious issues someone can get or serious health issues someone can get. Um, but uh, some focus group participants did feel that there was evidence of this new narrative around HIV cutting through. Um, so some mentioned recent examples of information and content about HIV that they felt was trying to improve education around HIV, address stigma, uh, TV programmes like It's a Sin and Soaps with HIV storylines, celebrities uh, coming out as living with HIV like Gareth Thomas. Um, films and, and just talk of hearing about it from friends, uh, family and friends as well. Um, it's important to say that um, media and celebrities are seen as particularly vivid and engaging formats and a good way to erase general awareness of HIV. However, the depth of information that people can actually recall from those sources, you know, when it comes to the real practical detail, um, knowledge of HIV and so on, uh, that is quite limited. So that might suggest that other routes are better suited when it comes to communicating very important specifics um, about HIV. So most of the public say they are empathetic towards those living with HIV, but that sympathy and support is often qualified. So just to emphasize, the public do widely agree that those with HIV deserve the same support and respect given to those with other health conditions. So we presented them with that statement. 85% agree, obviously it's not 100%, um, which many were, were surprised by in the focus groups, but it's, a, it's quite a high percentage. Next slide, please. However, only around a third of the public say that they have sympathy for all people living with HIV, regardless of how they acquired it. So what this chart shows here is we presented people with two statements uh, along a scale. So at one end of the scale, which was zero, there was, I don't have sympathy for some people living with HIV because of how they got it. At the other end was, I have sympathy for all people living with HIV, regardless of how they got it. What you can see is just 32%, so around a third, um, selected number 10 on that scale or selected that, that statement indicating that they definitely have that view or agree with that statement. There was a large proportion, 70%, that were closer to that end of the, of the scale, if you like, when they, when they indicated where they were. But what it does show is that there's around 64% of people who didn't select that, that number 10 on the scale um, where their sympathy for someone living with HIV is, is qualified to at least some extent based on how they acquired it. And then if we go to the next slide, qualitatively, this was um, sort of explained by 
some people being more judgmental uh, of, of, of HIV, uh, people with HIV when it had been acquired through condomless sex or sharing injecting um, equipment. So all the participants in this research uh, emphasised they would have sympathy for someone regardless of how they got HIV and that, that no one you know, deliberately or deserves to get HIV. But there was a significant minority eager to point out that, that you know, some people acquire it by accident or through no fault of their own, which appeared to kind of undermine that sentiment that they, they actually had support for everyone. And it was implied that those people deserve um, maybe more sympathy than those that had acquired it through certain ways. Next slide, please. So stigma towards those living with HIV does continue to exist and it is felt to be quite deeply entrenched. Next slide, please. So um, this is just a side of quotes, I think really showing that, that stigma and you might just wanna have a quick, um, a quick skim of them. Um, but what's interesting is that in the focus group, some participants didn't really uh, recognise their own uh, low levels of knowledge or that their views might be potentially stigmatising. Um, some presented some quite subjective comments and myths around HIV, like they were fact. For example, that people with HIV have lots of unprotected sex. Next slide, please. And interestingly, over half of the public um, in the survey um, agreed with the um, statement that people with living with HIV are likely to feel ashamed about it, which indicates an awareness of, of what we might call self-stigma that people with, with HIV might experience. Next slide, please. And in the focus group, there was a lot of concern that an awareness actually that people living with HIV are stigmatized by others. Um, they felt that that, 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 that that does happen in reality, even though people deserve respect. And many in the groups were unwilling to share some of their more unfiltered views about people living with HIV. There was a real sense of being scared to say the wrong thing, which indicates there is an element of, of social desirability bias when it comes to this topic and speaking about it in that setting. Uh, and the belief that people living with HIV might not be treated with respect was particularly strong in the focus groups with South Asian people, interestingly. And this stigma is really felt to centre around three main themes. Um, so getting HIV uh, or acquiring HIV is, is associated with some people with irresponsible or taboo behaviours. There's very low knowledge uh, of transmission, treatment and outcomes for people living with HIV and just broader negative attitudes towards uh, LGBT people who are still quite closely associated with HIV. So as I mentioned above, um, some are more judgmental of um, people with HIV based on how they acquired it, or that's what the data shows. Um, also around a tenth of the public think people with HIV has probably, have probably had lots of sexual partners. Uh, and that, that's obviously not a high percentage, but that was a sentiment that sort of underlied some of the um, focus group discussions. And low knowledge of transmission and just how far treatment has come is also felt by people to be a cause of that um, stigma. So a lot of participants felt like um, they thought that HIV could be passed on in ways that um, there is zero risk, ways like kissing or standing next to someone. Um, and also just that low knowledge of treatment, particularly around U equals U and how long people can actually live when they're, they can live kind of full happy lives um, when they're on, on treatment. And that low knowledge of that really increased that just sense of fear. Um, and and participants felt like that was a real cause of um, fear and stigma um, against people living with HIV. And just um, briefly, um, yeah, some, some just attributed this negativity to uh, latent and um, kind of obvious homophobia in society as well. That was still felt to be a, a factor there. So another thing we found was that most of the public say they're uncomfortable with having a sexual relationship with someone living with HIV. And this was really the, um, the sort of sticking, the sticking point for people. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So again, what this chart shows is those two statements that we asked people to indicate where, where their view kind of fell closest to. So on one end, we've got, I would feel comfortable having a sexual relationship with someone living with HIV. At the other end, I would not feel comfortable doing that. 
And as you can see, uh, just 3% of people said they definitely would feel comfortable having a sexual relationship with someone. And about 9% were, were sort of closer to that, that end of the scale. But a, quite a large majority um, were, were closer to being not comfortable. Um, and there were some groups that were slightly um, more likely to say that. So older people, uh, which kind of indicates younger people are slightly more open to that. And that was something that we saw qualitatively as well. Uh, black people, heterosexual, um, cisgender people, were that those were both um, more likely to say they would not be comfortable and those that do not personally know someone with HIV. And these concerns about sexual relationships specifically, um, so we didn't see this with any other kind of relationships, not friendships or sort of family relationships. It, 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 these concerns came out about sexual relationships specifically. Um, there was two main reasons for the, or, or themes that those reasons centered around. So the potential impact on, on personal health or the health of future children, and then also stigma and judgment from others that they might receive if they were in a relationship with someone that was living with HIV. So perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, the risk to personal health was the most front of mind factor for everyone uh, that we spoke to when they were thinking about sex with someone living with HIV, or at least that was what they claimed was the most um, front of mind factor. Um, they were worried that regardless of how effective treatment would be, uh, there, that there would just remain an element of risk. Uh, they pointed out treatment could not be 100% effective. Um, and there was just, this was kind of held by people even that had a relatively high awareness of, of, of U equals U, and there was just a bit of reluctance to set aside that risk. Uh, we heard from parents in particular um, that they would be very concerned if they found out their child was in a relationship with someone living with HIV, and they framed it as being concerned about their child's safety. Um, but you know, a small, a small number that, that did um, have awareness of treatment, stopping it being passed on, they did mention that that was a fact that could make people more comfortable around it or that would make them more comfortable if they knew that that, that person was on treatment. So that was acknowledged. Um, and for South Asian participants in particular, and to an extent older participants, uh, the worry that HIV could be passed on to future children was, was very front of mind, much more so than the others. And that aligned with this tendency towards thinking about relationships um, in the long-term sense, so potentially marrying this person or having children with them, as opposed to more casual sex or dating, and that was the lens that they were viewing this through. Um, and there was also just low understanding that children uh, born to mothers living with HIV and on effective treatment will, will not be born um, with HIV themselves. And as I mentioned, um, you can keep on that side, as it in. Um, but just as I mentioned, there is also that fear for some groups about being judged negatively or ostracized for being with someone with HIV. Um, I don't have a slide on that, but, but that was a sentiment that came through and that was particularly strong for uh, South Asian participants in this research, that fear of being judged by the community um, and, and there just being a lot of sort of cultural factors at, at play there as well. Um, so we did show people, um, and we're done, I'm just very conscious of time, I'll just be one more minute. Um, we did show people some information about HIV. Uh, and what we found was that when they saw that, that did um, decrease, but not eliminate um, discomfort about having a sexual relationship with someone with HIV. I think we've just gone a slide ahead, as I don't know if we just go back. There we go. Um, so what we found was that seeing information on treatment, so on U equals U, did, um, did kind of allay some of those, those fears around having a sexual relationship with someone. And it was just felt to be very important for reducing stigma. Um, participants felt like knowing about that would really help um, with, with that issue. And it should be widely available to the public. Um, and many just felt that, that information would make them more open to being in a sexual relationship with someone or want to make them find out more. Um, and we found that younger um, participants were, were more likely to kind of indicate that that would make them more open to it, particularly younger uh, black participants. Next slide, please. Next slide. So just to summarize as well, we tested a range of policies um, around uh, HIV. Some of these I believe are already in place and already the case, um, but just a nice positive finding from this work was that there's really high support for public policies that are aimed at um, increasing support for people with HIV, testing um, and just reducing transmission as well. Um, so 
that's just a nice piece, um, a nice finding from this work. Uh, all of those have majority um, supporting them, which is which is good news. Um, so hopefully that was interesting for everybody. Um, I believe I will now hand over to Kat Smithson, who's going to just talk about um, some of the, the response to those findings. Thanks so much. If you could um, stop sharing screen, Esbin, I'll um, share mine. Thanks very much. So my name is Kat Smithson. I'm the uh, Director of Policy and Communications at the National AIDS Trust. Um, and it's been my pleasure to work with uh, Fast Track Cities London and Britain Thinks on this project over sort of the last six months or so. Um, and I'm just going to give a really kind of quick response to the findings from National AIDS Trust's perspective and some of some sort of initial thoughts before we get into um, the community discussion panel, which uh, is, is where I think we'll get to the, the really interesting nitty gritty of this. But I um, just want to think about what some of these findings might mean. I'm hoping that my slides will move on. There we go. So first and foremost, what did we want from this program um, of work at, at National AIDS Trust? Uh, we wanted uh, community and stakeholder engagement and buy-in in the programme of work from the very beginning. We wanted to produce something that was genuinely useful for improving our knowledge base and work UK-wide, um, something that wasn't only for National AIDS Trust and to improve our, the evidence base that we work with, but also others right across the sector and within the community who are working on challenging stigma. Um, we wanted to produce credible findings from strong methodology, um, and we also wanted, in, in this case, to have insights that went beyond the data. So we didn't just want to know what people think, but we wanted a few insights into why people think that. And there are limitations on what you can kind of do with a, a limited pot of money. I think through using the focus groups in the way that we have, we've been able to achieve some of that. We also wanted um, learning that could then be applied to intervention and service design in the future, which is another reason why we really needed to try to get to some of those whys as well as the what's. And also we wanted to identify areas for future research and ideas for future research and work as well. And again, I think that we have found things within this that we weren't necessarily expecting. Um, and also we've identified um, some specific work that needs to be done with particular groups of people and things like that, that, that maybe um, we wouldn't have paid attention to otherwise. So what are some of the key takeaways from, from kind of my perspective? So the first kind of thing to say, I suppose, is that the public seems a little bit confused um, about HIV. Uh, I think some of the findings appeared at first contradictory or counterintuitive. And this came through kind of in the focus groups, too. And I think some of some of what Katie was just talking about shows that. So I think um, one thing to kind of really note is that knowledge appears very multidimensional. So those who knew about PrEP and um, U equals U, uh, which, um, for example, younger people were more likely to know about those things, were not necessarily also more likely to know that people won't always go on to develop AIDS. And they also weren't necessarily more likely to know about kind of the huge progress that we've had in terms of life expectancy um, with HIV. So other, other kind of fantastic treatment outcomes, even though they were aware of um, U equals U. And just to clarify as well, because we've had a couple of questions in the Q&A, U equals U is undetectable equals untransmissible. So um, essentially those on effective HIV treatment uh, cannot pass. HIV on, um, and um, that's because they achieve viral suppression, so their virus is undetectable. Uh, just moving on. So um, there's an appreciation that stigma and negative judgment exists, and that this is a bad thing. So that does seem to be an appreciation for that amongst the general public. But then there's also evidence that among um, most people, their support is, is kind of qualified in some way. And again, I think that was demonstrated in some of those attitudes things where you can see on the scale where people put themselves. And that people are not totally confident and comfortable about HIV. And a lot of this seems to be, there seems to be sort of remaining kind of fears. And, 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 and I think um, a lot of that is around confidence and feeling totally comfortable with, um, with their kind of knowledge base and that there is no risk in certain situations. The other thing is that stigma doesn't necessarily play out in the way that we might expect. Um, and one of those things is I think there's, there's often an assumption that people will be uncomfortable being offered HIV tests and things like that. And actually that wasn't really seen to be the case. Um, when we talked about this in um, focus groups, people were really open to being offered tests, even people who had maybe it sort of expressed some, some of the more 
challenging views around and attitudes around HIV, we're actually really open to kind of testing. And actually what, what we found was that the more routine and normalized testing is the better. Um, I think in particular because there's a perception and this really came out in the focus groups with, um, with black people that there's a perception that they're being targeted in some way by a lot of kind of interventions and testing interventions. Um, in particular, and actually just generalized, normalized routine testing um, is, is a really effective way of combating that. In terms of ongoing fears, therefore, um, there is a lot of confusion and misconceptions about how HIV can be transmitted. And these do seem to be closely linked to the discomfort um, that people report around potential sexual relationships with a person living with HIV. Um, having said that, this isn't only about transmission risk, but there were also concerns about kind of prognosis for the other person and judgment from others. Um, so I think, uh, you know, it's important to remember that a lot of people uh, at sort of, I suppose, um, look at this question in different ways. And a lot of people were thinking not only about sort of se sexual relationships with people, but also romantic relationships and the potential for a future with this person and things like that. And um, with the focus groups in particular, sort of um, some things sort of came out that might have appeared a bit left field that we wouldn't necessarily have thought about, like, um, you know, oh, what about what about children in the future and things like that, that were actually playing on people's mind when they were answering this question. Um, and again, it, it, I think that shows that sort of how, how important it is that people have a much more rounded picture and understand um, things even that sort of go beyond your basic kind of stuff about what the actual level of risk is um, through sexual contact. So 16% um, were aware of U equals U and a quarter of PrEP. And U equals U was relatively new information to those in focus groups. Or if they did say that they'd heard of it and knew about it, they didn't necessarily actually really understand it. So we had a few people who sort of said that they, they knew about U equals U and they'd heard about it. But actually, when they described it, they described it incorrectly, which we thought was quite interesting. Um, one thing with this is that there are some people who have a really strong initial positive reaction to U equals U and they kind of immediately take it on board and think it's something that's really exciting and amazing. And there's other people who, um, who don't seem to respond at first, um, and I think possibly because it does seem too good to be true, maybe, and they take time to process the information and understand it, and then perhaps later on will kind of refer to it and it will start to kind of sink in, and they might kind of um, think that they might sort of refer to it later on in relation to another question. Um, but this thing about there being sort of no such thing as no risk, um, and then also concerns that uh, U equals U is somehow it's sort of it's reliant on people taking their medication. These were kind of things that were commonly referred to. So this idea of um, still, I suppose, um, people feeling out of control in a way of their own kind of levels of risk and things because you're kind of reliant on another person um, to, um, to be taking their medication regularly or something like that. So in terms of addressing those fears, um, we feel like uh, that clearly bits of information are getting through, but this doesn't mean that someone is putting together an overall accurate picture. And um, this highlights a communications challenge that I think um, most of us are used to dealing with in HIV. And you've got to get that balance between getting a fuller picture out there while keeping messages digestible. And this is really not easy at all. And um, you know, health promotion experts have been struggling with this for years and we don't necessarily have all the answers. Trying to get across to people that U equals U is not uh, a sort of rare phenomenon, but that is actually the case for most people living with HIV in the UK. Is, is really key here, I think. And um, I think all too often, I think because, because we're talking about quite technical terms like being undetectable, virally suppressed, taking effective treatment, the, this sort of initial assumption is that that's not, that that's maybe something that only is only relevant to a few people. So actually sometimes flagging that this is actually the case for the vast majority of people living with HIV in the UK is, is potentially really, really powerful. And then also breaking down the barriers between people. So when people try to put themselves in the shoes of someone living with HIV and thought about things from their perspective, it did shift the conversation. So we already know that HIV training is more effective, um, for example, at, at, at challenging stigma when it involves people living with HIV. And presenting real life stories of people living with HIV and increasing visibility seems to be vital. There's a quote there from the report. All of these quotes and all of the data is in the report. 
In terms of opportunities, I don't have much time, so I'm gonna go through, fly through them. But I think there are a lot of opportunities here and things for us to build on, even though there are also some quite disappointing results um, within, within this survey. There is a recognition of stigma and a need to address it. Um, amongst kind of respondents to the survey and, and most people did report that they they had high levels of support for people living with HIV they felt that people living with HIV did deserve respect and focus group members were really horrified initially that anyone could think that someone living with HIV didn't deserve the same level of respect as people with other long-term conditions however this wasn't necessarily always fully reflected in comments later on um, and, and also so kind of participants were often nervous about saying the wrong things and held back, but then sometimes did anyway without realizing it. And, um, and I think that, that's also quite common and interesting. Um, but also a lot of focus group members also recognized that they weren't very knowledgeable and some even described themselves as ignorant, um, especially once they were presented with information. And they challenged themselves once they processed information and discussion with other members of the focus group, which is really interesting. Um, the public does have um, a really high level of support as well for public policies that are aimed at improving the rights and well-being of people living with HIV and at reducing HIV transmissions, and that's something we really need to capitalise on. We need action. Um, I, think, I really do think that this shows that members of the public want to know more about HIV, and there is broad um, support for a general public information campaign that was demonstrated within this survey as well. And there does seem to be a high level of interest and intrigue remaining um, around HIV. We really do need to leverage that. This further demonstrates that knowledge and improving knowledge is important um, and that better knowledge around HIV is strongly linked to support for people living with HIV. But it isn't as simple as just saying that if we improve knowledge, there will be no stigma. It is multidimensional, it's complicated and it's intersectional. So HIV stigma is complex and intersectional. There's no one size um, fits all kind of way of addressing it. Um, but we cannot challenge HIV stigma without challenging other stigmas and forms of discrimination. And this isn't something that I've necessarily touched on much within this, but we did, um, I think I think was highlighted by Katie quite well there. But what did come through in the focus groups was it was clear that um, people felt that the link with the, uh, with sort of um, remaining kind of homophobia and things like that, um, was something that was um, was a real factor. And bearing in mind those focus groups were done with um, quite specific groups and communities, I'm sure that we would find also that there are other intersecting factors as well that contribute to stigma that we need to be aware of. So the government really needs to hear this message and make sure that they look at wider inequalities if they are to address HIV stigma as part of the HIV action plan. It's not enough to say that we want to end discrimination of people living with HIV. We have to take a stand against discrimination and stigma in general. People generally assume that testing is more available than it actually is, um, which uh, was, was, I think, a really interesting finding. And generally, routine testing in settings like A&E and GPs was just seen as a no-brainer by people. Um, the last thing to say is that community-led action is absolutely vital. So personally knowing someone living with HIV made a significant difference to knowledge and attitudes. And focus groups repeatedly talked about real life stories they'd heard as reference points for their knowledge, even those stories that were maybe celebrities, um, um, as well as people that they'd known either in the past or kind of in the present. And if those stories are relatable, then that's even better. So if people can see themselves and see their own communities and people that they might um, sort of, you know, can see within people, people that they might spend time with day to day, that makes it even more kind of, um, important in terms of like breaking down barriers, stopping othering of people and really trying to sort of open up people's minds to thinking in a slightly different way about HIV. So those are my contact details because I'm sure there's lots um, that could be followed up with here as well as the contact details of Hannah Ward who is going to be um, covering me from next week. I'm now going to hand over to Angelina um, Namira, who is um, an trustee, NAT trustee, who is going to um, chair our community panel. Um, and uh, hopefully that should work. I'm gonna hand over to you now and Angelina, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kat. And I'd like to say a very warm welcome to our panelists who've kindly agreed to contribute to this part of today's event. Uh, in follow-up to uh, Kat's last point, uh, this panel discussion is titled, Are There Lessons from the Data on How We Can Support Community-Led Action 
to address HIV stigma. So we do have uh, some time to take a few que audience questions later on, hopefully. And can I just remind you, as Jane said, to please continue putting your questions in the Q&A function as we're going to be monitoring this for this purpose. We have a fantastic panel of speakers this afternoon, and without much further ado, I'm going to introduce each one of them in turn. Our first speaker is Mark Thompson. Mark is an activist, health promotion specialist, and mentor. He is co-director of the Love Tank, a not-for-profit community interest com com community that promotes health and well-being of, of underserved communities through education, Jesus. capacity building, and research. Mark is also the co-founder of Prepster and Blackout UK and developed and coordinated Project 100, the country's peer mentor program for people living with HIV. His work is focused on Black and queer communities, sexual health and HIV, with a particular interest in the intersection of race, sexuality, and HIV. Our second speaker is Shamal Warich. Shamal is a British South Asian living with HIV and works as senior peer support worker for Central and Northwest London NHS Trust at the Bloomsbury Clinic. Shamal is also co-founder of Sahar, the South Asian HIV Advisory Resource Network. Um, our next speaker is Jamie Bennett. Jamie is a member of the Community Advisory Group of Fast Track Cities London and is Evolving HIV Care Project. They are also a volunteer for Spectra and GMI Partnership, doing HIV testing and outreach. Our fourth speaker is Rebecca Mbewe. Rebecca is a trainer, mentor, and a speaker with lived experience of HIV for 24 years. Currently, uh, the GROWS, which stands for Growing Older, Wiser, Stronger, Advocacy and Training Coordinator with Positively UK, and amongst other things, Rebecca is a community link on the Fast Track Cities, London Task and Finish Group, and Community Advisory Group, managed to get that one out. She also co-directs Forum Mental Mothers Network, CIC, and is a passionate advocate for women's sexual and reproductive health rights. And our last but no, by no means least speaker is Robert James. Robert teaches on the qualifying social work courses at Sussex University. He has been involved in the HIV sector since the late 1980s, at various times volunteering or working for NAT, THT, Mainliners, Body Positive, the Hemophilia Society, and many more. He is involved in the infected blood public inquiry into the circumstances leading to the infection of blood and blood products with HIV and viral hepatitis during the 1970s and the 1980s and a very warm welcome to you all. So my first question is going to be all of, to all of you, but I'm going to begin with you, Mark. <laughs> so the, my question is, um, so what are your initial reactions to the data that has just been presented? Thanks, Angelina. Uh, it's a delight to be here. I missed your introduction because my computer would skew with, so I hope you gave me a nice one there. Yeah. I definitely- Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks very much, Angelina. I've had an opportunity to have a listen and to read some of the report. And to be straight up with you, I was disappointed, I was upset, and I was very angry. And if anybody knows me, that's not really easy to happen. But I was really angry by, by, by the findings of the report, because I thought, here we are 30 years, 40 years later, and we're still having to deal with this. But to be honest with you, I wasn't surprised because I know that this is the lived reality of many of us who are living with HIV, who walk, walk this journey every single day. I'm really grateful that as a man who is long-term diagnosed, I have had the opportunity to engage in peer support. I've had the opportunity to have education. I've had the opportunity to, be, to get agency so I can push back against that stigma. But I do think it's really, really concerning that this is still the facts. But as I said, it doesn't surprise me. We've got really poor sex and relationships education in this school. There's been a huge absence of HIV, apart from we can think about it's a sin, which again is giving a particular picture, an image, and a historical one of what HIV is like. So again, people may engage in that program and still think that's what HIV looks like today. And even when we have celebrities who are out and open about their HIV status, which I welcome, they again are 
repeating a narrative, cisgendered white men of a certain age get HIV, so therefore this is the community. So I think these are challenges for us. But as a health promoter and an activist and somebody that's been working in the sector as long as I've been diagnosed, I also think we as a sector need to do some real soul searching. Mm. Because as I saw in some of the chat earlier on, the fact that the world doesn't still understand you equals you, that's not simply down to the fact that they don't understand the science. It's about who gets HIV. They don't believe us. HIV is taboo because black people get it, gays get it, trans people get it, sex workers get it, black women get it. And these are people that you don't trust. But I think for us as a HIV sector and community, we need to do soul searching because we've invested a lot of money in campaigns and interventions to tell people that HIV can't be passed on. We've been on the backs of buses and billboards. We've been in areas with black people and brown people and they're not getting this message. So what are we doing that isn't working? So I would really welcome us to take a step back, look at the work that we're doing within the HIV sector and think, okay, how can we do better to change this narrative for those who are most affected? And I found some ways the best work is, as people have said, the stories and narratives are empowering us to go forward and fight this fight. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Jamie, I'm gonna go over to you. Um, what why are your initial reactions to the data? Thanks, Angelina, and thanks, Mark. I agree with everything you've said then. Um, I'll start with the positive. Um, I like the opt-out testing. I'm glad that the public are behind that. That's really good. Um, and also to confront that there are gaps in knowledge, as Mark was just talking about. Um, I'm a trans person, and I am living with HIV. And I was looking through the report, and I noticed that there were six people, participants in the survey, who are also trans or um, have a different gender to the one that they were assigned at birth. Those people and their experiences and uh, perceptions didn't feature in the report. I couldn't find, find them anywhere. And there wasn't anything qualitative in there either to hear what they thought. Um, and that just meant that trans people's experiences were kind of subsumed into the LGBT broader sort of grouping, um, which is a problem for trans people living with HIV. It kind of makes us think we don't exist, and that's a problem. Um, we need to have information about us, uh, what people think of us, so that we can address our own stigmas, and that's not, that's not there. It, it makes me kind of wonder, does the general public have an awareness that there is a community of trans people living with HIV? Um, so we've been erased, we've been erased. And that's a common theme for trans people in general, even those that don't live with HIV, we're waiting for five to 10 years to be seen by the NHS, to be taken on by the NHS, to have our care. Um, we are gate kept out of legally being recognized as our accurate gender. And then the stigma that trans people have, particularly trans women, particularly trans women of color, particularly trans women of color who are sex workers, um, the stigma on those people um, excludes you from society. Um, and then you add on HIV to that as well. Um, it's a lot. Um, so that's kind of um, my main response so far. Um, I was very glad to see actually, last one, um, that women, LGBT people and black people are supportive, uh, oh no, um, trust in um, sexual health charities and HIV charities to get their information about HIV. So that, that encapsulates why community-led um, organizations are really important. Yeah, that's me. Thank you very much, Jamie. So I'm gonna move over to Rebecca. Rebecca, what were your initial thoughts, the reactions? Uh, thank you, Angelina. Um, mine were not dissimilar to Mark's or Jamie's. Um, my initial sort of reaction is what the findings were were not surprising, um, a little bit reassuring, but the report has just highlighted what we as people living with HIV have always known and continue to experience in our day-to-day -day sort of lives. Um, it's gotten slightly better, but I still feel there's work that needs to be done um, to change people's attitudes and perceptions about HIV to move away from, you know, the old iceberg uh, sort of fear mongering kind of, of approach that's always been there. We need to get 
positive messages out. And the only way we can do that is if we, as people living with HIV, um, you know, can do what the report says, uh, provide relatable stories to people and show that we're actually living, uh, you know, well and living healthily. Um, you know, it's reassuring, uh, like I said, because there, we can see that there are steps um, being made to move away that are far more visible nowadays. And we can see where efforts are being made. Um, we acknowledge that, you know, the, the population are, are becoming a little bit more receptive to information and learning about HIV. But I still go back to the point that we have a huge amount of work to do to be able to get to the point where um, it's almost at par, if not at par with the uh, advances that we've made in treatment. Um, so we need to be at that level of thinking as well. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And um, over to you, Shamal. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just going to echo exactly what Mark, Jamie and Rebecca are saying. For me, um, reading the report, it was shocking, but I'm not surprised at all. Um, I'm really grateful that these focus groups did take place um, because not enough of them are done, not enough conversations are done with these kind of people from BAM backgrounds and South Asian backgrounds. Um, but I do feel that there's a lot there when it comes to shame and stigma um, that we reassociate it with being uh, sympathizing or feeling sorry for people. Um, and I just wanna be clear, as somebody who's living with HIV from a South Asian background, I'm not a victim. I'm somebody who, you know, has been through a difficult journey, but that's irrelevant. At the end of the day, I'm somebody who's on effective treatment, um, uh, undetectable, which means I'm untransmittable. So for me, I don't want people to feel sorry for me. I came into health and social care and the work I do in sexual health empowers me um, to educate other people and let them know about what it is to live today with HIV. And I think some of the views in the, in the report were kind of contradictory and quite judgmental. I mean, there was one bit where the they, participants were asked whether uh, they should know if, the, if their partner is HIV positive and that they should tell them and they should disclose to them so that they can make an honest and well-informed decision. But like I said to you, I'm, I'm, I'm making an honest and well-informed decision here by telling you that I am uh, undetectable and untransmittable. So why do I need to tell you that when I know my community or people from my community, from these communities will then judge me or shun me for it? So I think, yeah, there was a lot of uh, contradictory views in there, but I do appreciate the work that Nat and Britain Thinks has done to produce the support. And I think we need to catch the work the net much wider so we get more opinions and more views from a wider range of group of people. Thank you very much, Jamal. And last but not least, Robert. Thank you. Um, well, I'll, I'll try and say something different to everybody else because obviously I'm going to agree with most of what people have said and it's a bit boring if everybody just says the same thing. So um, one of the things I noticed was the perception of stigma for people with HIV it was a similar sort of level to the same, to a figure found for general disabled people. Um, and I looked at a, a report by Scope that had used the British Social Attitude Survey. It's a slightly different uh, question, but the, the general public perception of the stigma we face was similar. And therefore I thought there might be some useful work that could be done with other disability charities to think about that. I thought it was really sad that a quarter of the people who know someone with HIV still said they would not have a sexual relationship with someone with HIV. And I know it was lower than the people who didn't, but um, I mean, are there that many horrible people with HIV that they know? Um, it, uh, that, that I thought seemed a shame. The other point that came out to me quite interestingly, and it probably says as much about my own knowledge and thinking was that, um, the group that was identified as black generally scored as having a, a much more widespread comfort with people with HIV, whether that was working or that was as a neighbor or as a family member, didn't follow for a sexual relationship, but much more comfortable than white people. And I wondered, I suspect that is not a, a feeling that is particularly common in the HIV sector, an awareness that the, some of the black communities actually have better knowledge around HIV than our white communities. And that uh, we see that as more an issue around stigma 
then perhaps we should and give more credit to those communities. And the last one I noticed um, was we still have toilet seats. Why do toilet seats get in this as a route of transmission? And I would say in London, I noticed it was 5%, one in 20 as opposed to 3% in the rest of the country. And being from Brighton, I'm, I'm gonna take some credit as not being a Londoner. Um, we were a fast track city before London, but I just started, did, did, are there people who think toilet seats are a transmission route for every disease in the world? I mean, <laughs> and I should stop there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Robert. Um, I mean, so given what we've just had and, and looking at the panel as a whole, I mean, I just, I mean, we're, we're looking at talking about a community-led action. So what I'm going to ask now is, um, so what does community-led mean to you, right? And I'm going to start this question with, with you, Shamal. I think the, thank you very much. I think this is probably one of the most complicated uh, questions and I'm gonna kind of give you a bit of context here. So I'm a Lancashire boy, born in Rochdale. My father's Pakistani, my mum's Indian Gujarati, born in Kenya. So I already have different, many different cultures and communities involved. And I don't really always sometimes used to find my own community and my identity amongst that. And I think it's really, really good that these focus groups did pick up South Asians. But when we look at South Asians in a whole, um, we're talking about an area, you know, from India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, which is where we were focusing. That's 1.8 billion people. That's a place which has about four major religions. We're talking about 25 national languages, over 600 dialects, and countless cultural identities. So what community are we talking about? And that's where I think the difficulty comes even more. Take it a step further. In my clinic, for instance, in my sexual health clinic, when somebody's brown, for instance, they will kind of look to me and go, oh, Shmel, can you have a conversation with them? Because you might be able to identify with them. They they could be from North Africa, they could be from the Middle East, from Central Asia, Australasia, or South Asia. But the, the, the idea is that because they're, I suppose, South Asian under that bracket or brown, I would kind of understand what their community and culture is. So I think it's really, really important that we do continue these conversations. We cast the, the network wider and we start bringing people in from across the community from different areas. So at the moment, something like Sahar that we set up is about bringing people from across South Asian communities and backgrounds to be able to change the narrative and be able to be included in that. So we're working with other organizations and partners who are already doing work within the sector, but bringing peers in into the conversation to go, how do we communicate and how do we translate this to your community? Give another example. If something we do, we do a resource that's say focus on the Bangladeshi community in Whitechapel, that's not going to work for somebody like in South uh, in South Hall, who are a Punjabi community, even though we're all from South Asia. So I think we need to think a bit more about what we actually mean when we talk about community and we brand somebody as South Asian or Black, because it's a lot more diverse than it actually is. Thank you very much. Really well put, uh, Shaman. So I'm going to ask Rebecca the same question. I mean. What, what do you, what does community mean to you? Community led action to you? Okay, um, for me, it's exactly that, led by the community. And I'm gonna put it in the context of when we're talking about care and, you know, um, our healthcare uh, sort of approaches and what we need as the community. Um, for me, it's a bottom-up approach rather than a top-down one, which which means any decisions, and I appreciate that, you know, we need to get to a middle ground, not everything is possible, but it's important because that's the impact of the lives of people living with HIV need to be informed by exactly that, you know, our point of view. There's, I'll give you an example. There's a very simplistic example. There's no point in making me a cup of tea with milk when I know I'm intolerant to it. Ask me and I'll tell you, black tea without sugar is fine. And that way I'm happy. And you as the people who are providing the services and the money, you're also happy. It's economically viable and it's more sustainable. But at the end of the day, because you've asked me, you've involved me as the community, it's a win-win situation. You know, a really good example of where that's recently happened, for example, is the Fast Track Cities Evolving Care Initiative. Community was involved right from the beginning and the conversations I had right from the beginning, people were sitting at the table. And I think that's a really good approach because then you can um, you know, listen to both sides of the table. And that's where I'm gonna leave it. It's about um, being 
involved right from the beginning, right throughout the process. And that way you reach an understanding. Thanks, Rebecca. And um, Robert, have you got anything different to add? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, as the white heterosexual cisgender male, um, I suppose that I should say we should just run everything, shouldn't I? Um, <laughs> we tried that and that worked very well, didn't it? Um, but uh, a community to me, to some extent, it's also about one's own identity mm. and what one chooses to be when one chooses to be in the community. And if I think about my community, I can find that quite easily in terms of haemophilia, other people with haemophilia with HIV, although we're getting smaller and smaller, but um, there's a few of us. But I also think of just generally people with HIV as part of my community. When it gets to my ethnicity, because I'm in the dominant majority, it kind of disappears and I can particularly remember being in the pub once with a group of friends and I realized I had the most boring ethnicity you could find no I'm not even got any Welsh or Scottish in me you know I'm my parents were English my grandparents were born in England I had nothing um but uh so I suppose what that also says to me though is I suspect that whilst we all identify with different communities we probably also see ourselves as a mixture of being part of a community and part of the general public Mm. both in a, a majority and a minority in certain aspects, whether that's our attitudes or that's our um, ethnicity in my case, or the way we think the world should be, that we're with a group of people and we support some of the dominant views in society and not some of the others. So I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We've got a few minutes uh, on this question. So I'm going to ask uh, Jamie as well, um, what does community led mean to you? Well, I think just what everyone said, really, um, we are, if you find you create a community based organization for people who are in your community, you can reach them, you can have better reach engagement, you can target them and um, you know how to what areas of stigma are hitting you and how to message and to in order to stop that or to try and combat that. Um, totally agree with Rebecca, what Rebecca said about bottom up. Um, I think uh, I'll go back to the data thing again. Um, we have no data on trans men who are living with HIV at the moment and trans men, their uh, care in the NHS is appalling. And so it falls to community led organisations to be the only intervention to give trans men the care that they need. So community led uh, uh, organizations are essential especially in the in the trans community places like clinic q 5060 yeah thanks jamie and uh, mark do you want to have a quick final word on this one before i ask you all the last question yeah sure i mean you know i, I agree with what uh, colleagues have already said that it needs to be a bottom-up approach but also let's let's a bottom up it also needs to be a top-down approach right so who are CEOs? Who are leaders? Who are lead clinicians? Who are our commissioners? Are they coming from our communities? Are they black? Are they brown? Are they trans? Are they sex workers? So that's what community led means. And then also for me as a black gay man who lives with HIV, I operate in several communities. Mm. And so those can lead in different ways. But I think the question we also need to ask ourselves is, are the communities that we want to engage, who we want to be leaders, do they have the tools and the resources and the skills to do so? So for example, if we look at black African women, the second largest group in this country to be affected by HIV, why are they not in leadership roles? Why are they at the front face of HIV stigma fights or providing services and care? What is that about? And it's not about the black women, it's because the system's in place, disempower them. So how are we empowering these women to step up so they can be community led. So it goes back to the very first question. We can't address this until we're addressing the health inequalities, sexism, racism, homophobia, and misogyny. Once we start doing that, then we can really have a community led approach. So let's start empowering those of us who are at the bottom of a pile to reach to the top. Okay, thank you very much, Mac. We're very well put. And so going back to the data, and this is my final question on this one, and then we'll try and take some questions from, the audience um considering i mean what, what uh we now know from your very all of your very wonderful definitions when we talk about communities going back to the data what are the lessons we can we can take from this data on how and some of you have already started um addressing it already how we can address stigma in the community 
Yeah, that, is that clear or do I, shall I repeat it? You kind of get it, don't you? Yeah. So I'm going to start this question with the woman. <laughs> Rebecca, what are your thoughts? How can we start? To, how can we address stigma in the community? Um, I think one main point for me is recognizing that communities are diverse. So therefore, our approach also needs to be diverse. There are lots of, um, you know, multi layers within those communities. So, you know, when we're talking about strategies and approaches, we need to take this into account when addressing stigma. Mm -hmm. It's not one size fits all. Um, and the other point to make, I guess, is there's still lots of work that needs to be done to increase awareness and that HIV is not infectious. And I say in inverted commas, in the ways that people assume it is a very manageable um, for the most part. And I say for the most part, because it doesn't mean it comes without its challenges, but so does diabetes and chronic fatigue, et cetera. You know, the challenge with HIV is that the stigma around it, self or otherwise, is doubly hard to deal with um, things that others don't even have to think about. And I'll just, yeah, pass the button on to someone else. Thank you. Shall we pass the button on to Jamie? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Angelina. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I would say um, that these community organisations, a lot of them aren't fully funded, so fund them. <laughs> I think that's, um, but that's that echoes what Mark was saying as well about resourcing people um, in order to get to leadership roles or whatever. Um, but I think for, I know that um, trans organizations like Clinic Q and Spectra that provide mental health support, which are very important for trans people with living with HIV. Um, there are waiting lists that go on forever for months and months. Um, and I'm sure in lots of other communities as well. And um, without funding, that's only gonna worsen. Um, but yes, that's a way to combat internalized stigma for sure. Um, Thank you, Jamie. And over to you, Shamal. Yeah, um, I think we just kind of need to understand what we're talking about when we say stigma. So for a long time, if I wasn't white, I was BAME. So it's quite nice in this context to actually see South Asian come up. Um, but I do think that our, you know, uh, policymakers, uh, HIV charity, community organizations, charities do need to understand who we're actually talking about when we identify BAME, who are these refugees, migrants, where do they come from? What are their cultural identities? What communities are they part of and actually really bring them into the, the narrative and start talking to them from as Mark and both Rebecca have said from the bottom down and from the top up so that they're included in the conversation and we actually really understand who is it we're talking about it's really really good that there are you know media uh, opportunities to, to talk about it there's a reality tv star using his privilege and a platform to talk about living with HIV which is fantastic to have that visibility but that's not going to reach my community. Those conversations are never going to, nobody's going to understand if I was to say, oh, this person, you know, really big high figures living with HIV, talking about it. My mum, my dad, my uncle are going to be good for them, but they will never understand. So we really need to bring and understand who those people are that are stigmatised in, in those diverse communities and bring them into the conversation from all angles, top down, left, right and centre. Thank, <laughs> Thank you very much, Shamal. Mark? Thanks, Ange. Um, so I've got I've got like four quick things. Number one, we need to get a bit more radical, take the gloves off and have a zero tolerance approach to stigma. So we know, for example, the King's Fund report a couple of years ago uh, told us that there was a lot of stigma going on in healthcare settings. So we as a community and a sector, fast track cities, NAT, everybody else needs to have a zero tolerance approach towards HIV stigma. That's number one. Number two, we need to evaluate what we've already done. So I mentioned campaigns and interventions which are around promoting HIV testing or talking about U equals U and can't pass it on. Let's evaluate how effective they have actually been in reducing HIV stigma in the general population. We've seen huge amounts of cuts to HIV services, particularly those which are taken up by people living with HIV. So let's challenge those cuts. But the, one of the most effective pieces of work that I've ever been involved in, in all my years in the HIV sector, and my favourite, the moment I'm most proud of, is Project 100 at Positively UK. The peer mentoring programme trained over 700 people with HIV, and I saw the direct impact that that had on individuals feeling empowered, going back into their communities, back into their worlds, 
losing some of the self-stigma and challenging HIV stigma on an interpersonal level and on a macro level. That no longer exists in the way that we did. So let's put some money into programs that train us up and help us to deal with the internalized stigma so we as individuals can fight back. There's a reason that Jamie, Robert, Rebecca, and Shamal and I and Angelina are on this call today because we've, we've been beneficiaries of that as of a number of people in the chat. So I would see more investment in peer support, peer mentoring programs to help people like us. Thank you very much, very well put. And Rob, do you have any last word on this one before I take questions from the audience? Okay, I'll try and be quick. Um, I was just thinking about stigma. One of the things that comes out of the report and it's come out before, but it's not just about knowledge. So we need a way of challenging stigma that's not just providing information. Um, the point Mark's made, I think is really good about uh, knowing someone and therefore people being with HIV, being comfortable and confident and talking about it, being empowered to talk about it. So that there is a personal connection makes a difference, but I suspect there's something else we need. And I don't know what that is in order to really have an impact on stigma amongst the wider general population. And I'm, I just want to stick up for Gareth Thomas in that uh, he's a rugby player um, rather than a media personality. I know he's a commentator now, but I do wonder if, as, as the heterosexual man on the group, am I the only one who actually watched him play rugby, league <laughs> and union anyway? <laughs> Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you very much, um, panelists. And before you go, because we've got some questions from the audience, and one of the first questions we got uh, is actually for all of you. So I'm happy for whoever is happy to take the question to take it. Uh, the question was from Emma, and she asks, um, does the panel think self-testing for HIV will improve gaps and tackle stigma or not? Who would like to take this one? Rob? Well, I, I, I'm going to take it because this is my chance to say we do lots of self-testing in Brighton because we have vending machines. Um, you buy our vending machines. Um, at, uh, the Martin Fisher Foundation has vending machines where people do their own self-testing. You just go to the sauna and they're in a number of saunas in Brighton. Um, I think, and I'm going to make some guesses now, I'm not sure it's going to reduce stigma because I suspect the way it would reduce stigma is if people then do test positive and then become involved and find out about HIV, whereas they weren't in the past. But I, I wonder if the, the types of people who are going to self-test are much less likely to be um, stigmatizing to start with, or they wouldn't go for a self-test, they just choose not to test. They'd feel it wasn't something appropriate for them. Now I might be wrong on that, but that would be my initial guess. Um, but I think it's a really good idea. We should have as many testing opportunities as possible. We should really get it in boots. I mean, you know, we do that for pregnancy. Why not for HIV? <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Rob. Rebecca? I, I, I'd like to think on, on their own, possibly not. I think it's got to be um, a combination of self-testing. I think also it depends on the community. Some of the communities uh, use self-testing methods methods because they're private you can do it on your own but also that's in a sense fueled by stigma they don't want to go to or don't feel comfortable enough to want to go to a sexual health um, clinic to have those conversations so it's a bit of both I think on its own I don't think um, it'll improve the knowledge or you know that kind of thing or, or you know tackle stigma or improve issues around stigma, I think there's a whole combination of stuff that needs to happen as well as self-testing. It's a really good incentive, of course. Um, and I agree with you, Robert, if we can have, you know, pregnancy tests out there, why can't we have this? It's a good one, but we need to um, add other things on top of it if we're gonna, you know, get the maximum benefit out of it. Thanks, Rebecca. So we've got another question here for the panel and it's from Catherine Dodds. Hi, Catherine. Um, she says, do the panelists agree with Mark and Jamie's sentiments that to tackle uh, HIV stigma, we need to take on the inequalities that underpin it rather than only focusing on information about treatment, etc. This means all of us upping our game, as Mark has said. Do you agree with him? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, the short answer is yes. <laughs> Okay, so we had a few other questions, uh, not necessarily for the panel, but um, I'm going to ask um, 
think we've got a bit of time for a few more. A lot of the questions were about getting the presentations after them. I think that's going to happen. But was, there's a question here, which is from um, do, do, um, again, Catherine. And I, I guess this one is for Britain first, if you're able to answer. Um, during when you're doing the interviews, where the wrong mode of transmission was um, was uh, ticked, was there an opportunity to share uh, in the right information? Oh, um, there unfortunately wasn't in the survey, no, which is a shame. Um, but we did um, in the, all the focus groups, all the qualitative work, we directed people to the National Aids Trust website just for further information. Um, about HIV as part of that um, process. So um, I also, Angelina spotted another good question um, in, the, in the chat from an anonymous, anonymous person, uh, mm -hmm. which is what actions can policymakers in all four UK governments do to help address some of the findings in this report? So have we got anybody who is happy to respond to that? Uh, Rob, you've got your hand up. Well, I, I'm going to cop out because I've just also been thinking about the question before the one or one before about um, the issue around uh, other oppressions within society and meeting those before it becomes about HIV information. And what I was thinking about that was, well, other people also have responsibilities to do that. And now we've got to government, I've got to the right place. So they are in a very powerful position, those four governments. So looking at those inequalities in our society is a very obvious thing that I think they could start doing, as well as looking at uh, some of the things that Mark mentioned around funding. And because I keep jumping in, I shall shut up and let someone else ask, <laughs> speak. Okay. Um... If um, Shamal, you can have the last word on this before I hand over. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just going back to in, in context of the self-testing and online testing, um, I think it's really, really important to be using um, and getting people to be more educated around HIV and understanding what it means to be living with HIV today and opening that access to testing, treatment and prevention methods like PrEP. There's just a lack of understanding there. I think policymakers in the government need to work on developing that. I know from COVID, that's opened a whole new avenue for people to access online testing, but not enough people are aware of it um, but you know from somebody who used to go to a sexual health clinic and feel that was a very stigmatized place now I work there it's a totally different conversation but um, you know being able to access online testing and self-testing but that education needs to be there and that information needs to be coming from these organizations from these policymakers, and from government. Thank you very much Shamal and that brings us immediately to the end of the panel discussion I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of the panelists for your very rich and insightful contributions. And now I'm going to hand you over back to Jane. Angelina, thank you very, very much. And a huge thank you for chairing that panel and for all the speakers. That was really insightful. It's made me think a huge amount. And I'm coming away, I'm having read the data and now having heard this discussion um, with a, a whole new way of thinking about where we might go. because. It seems to me to you know take what um, what Mark's been saying. A lot of people been talking about um, upping our game. Well, let's see how this data helps the game get upped, and it's going to have to be upped by a lot of people in a lot of places. But we've got data, we've got some information, and I think that puts us into a much stronger uh, place. So a huge thank you, uh, panelists, speakers, uh, everybody who's been involved in getting us uh, to here in all the different stages. And thank you, NAT, Britain Thinks, and the Fast Track team for actually getting this webinar and getting this really important discussion out uh, into the world today. Um, However depressing some of the features we've heard are, there is really important information in there. And this is only the start because actually, as I say, we know much more now about what we might need to be challenging, which I think is a really important head start. Um, and this is this webinar, of course, is only the start and we can only touch the surface. And I would invite, you know, I really urge all of you to read um, the, as much of the report as you can. It's full, but it's really valuable and it's really important data that's in there. Um, 
We'll be looking to see what this work means for all our organizations for the Fast Track Cities program in London. Um, but as I say, we've got a much better idea of what it is uh, we're facing. Um, I also know that NAT is very keen to work with other stakeholder groups, communities across the UK, and to think what this research means to them and how it can all be built on. And yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the game being up, seeing what comes next and how we use this data to make a difference. So huge thank you to everybody. Um, I think this is a really important day and it's going to take us forward. So thank you for all the work. Kat, thank you very much uh, for bringing us together and for today's work. Thank you all.